have a, this, this understanding that the cells are built a certain way. Well, we're the practitioners who are here, we're clinicians, we're interested in looking at the body and how, can, and how we can intervene in such a way that we can improve well-being, we can optimize well-being, all right? And we're gonna look at the clinical aspect here. Tensegrity structure, this is from uh, Dr. Ingber, who's the uh, cell biologist at Harvard, uh, who did the cellular research, basically proving what others have been saying, like Dr. Levin over the years, actually visibly uh, being able to see this at the cellular level. So uh, Buckminster Fuller takes credit for the word tensegrity, but in fact, it's something that's been around forever. So if you look at the cytoskeleton, you can actually see the geodesic framework. This is cytoplasm. Basically, this is the inside of what the cell looks like. It's a geodesic structure. It's a solid state system. And the physiology of the cell depends on the integrity of that system. Dr. Ingber goes on to state that when there's mechanical changes in the cell, you change the shape and the dynamics of the cell, you're altering the arrangement of molecules, the arrangement of how, how cofactors and enzymes interact, even the shape of the nucleus, therefore genetic expression can also be affected. And for example, when you take this structure and you alter its shape, you can actually create cell proliferation, which is, in his words, leads to the idea that maybe cancers are related to the mechanics of the cell. The uh, other area of density is the crystalline bone structure, which we'll, we'll see today has a major, is a major area of restriction that essentially absorbs energy, changes its properties, which then impart other alterations to joint mechanics and musculoskeletal mechanics as well. So this is a little model. I call it, it's the Hoberman sphere. My good friend, Joe Hoberman, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, if you look at the geodesic, this represents the geodesic framework inside uh, or around uh, an organ, for example, a fluid-filled organ like the heart. If you, could, if you imagine water being in here, uh, use the analogy of, let's say, a, um, a water balloon, okay? If you drop a water balloon on the ground, what's, what tends to happen to that structure? Okay, if it's filled with water. But water can only do one thing. Water, by its nature, is extremely dense packed molecules. You cannot push water molecules any closer than they are. It's called a non-compressible substance. Extremely tightly packed, very dense, therefore very heavy. All right? So when energy, uh, mechanical energy is transferred to the fluid, the fluid has to do something with the energy converted to kinetic energy. It can only expand outward. That energy, in my opinion, is transferred to the structures around it, including the myocardium, the pericardium, and ultimately the chest wall. All right? So we see people with, we talk about these uh, you know, enlarged hearts. We know people who are not athletes have enlarged hearts. Some athletes have enlarged hearts. Some don't. Some, many non-athletes have enlarged. So this idea of why an enlarged heart happens or even myocardial uh, hypertrophy, some of it is based on, again, confounding evidence. We say, oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an athlete, therefore he must, that's why it happened. I would say it's questionable at best, all right? So we're changing the mechanics of these tissues and therefore these organs now become centers of restriction which we also believe change the physiology, all right? For example, heart murmurs, cardiomyopathies, and so on. Other organs that I find commonly, liver, spleen, kidneys, we also see uterine injury. I can pretty much tell a, a woman or predict or, or uh, somehow discern that she probably had an impact injury during pregnancy because the uterus becomes a significant primary restriction the further into pregnancy that that person is, okay? And uh, they often have subsequent problems with the uterus if they've had a fall during pregnancy, for example. This represents, uh, just in general, the fluid fills structures within the chest cavity, but other organs, of course, are affected. Impact tends to change that, and you get enlargement because of the transfer of energy from the fluid to the organ, ultimately the chest wall, okay? And that's quite... Uh, uh, an important part of what we're doing. Bone is another rigid substance. You can tell by the way it bounced on the screen. I didn't do that myself. That just happened. And you add energy to it in terms of impact, 
In fact, all of the cells of the matrix expand. The, 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 that oscillation model is perfect because it explains a high energy state, which is an expanded state. This is the high energy state. It oscillates between these two structures. All right? It's constantly going back and forth. However, if there is a localized concentration of energy continually maintained around the structure, it will tend more towards, in my opinion, this enlarged restricted state, which we can actually visibly see. And I'll get you to actually observe that on yourselves in a few minutes. It's kind of scary. For example, if we look at bone, we can see it, this is something we learned in chiropractic school, many orthopedists. I mean, you're, we're used to the fact that many arthritic joints the actual bones are enlarged. And people have said for years, well, well, I asked the question, why is it enlarged? No one gave me a suitable answer. You know? So they say, oh, it's part of the arthritic degenerative process. It enlarges. We don't know exactly. They, and in fact, my contention is that it enlarges, which changes the shape, the relative shape of the structures involved. And you're basically trying to fit one structure that no longer fits in the other. It's, it's different shapes. You get wear and tear. You get actual transfer of energy to the articular cartilage, which should not be a weight-bearing structure. It should be completely, uh, there should be a space there, but it breaks down when you alter the shape of the structures involved, okay? So you can see that in the neck, you get changes in the shape. Here you see a neck where it's relatively horizontally shaped, and you get enlargement, lengthening of the vertebral bodies. I, I presented a paper at the University of Illinois in 2004 uh, Dr. Masi, who's the head of rheumatology, I think you, you conversed with him, he uh, read about my work and invited me to come down and do a presentation, and he said his particular interest was ankylosing spondylitis. I said, well, I haven't seen many cases of it. And, um, well, of course, the universe intervened, and that week I got a new, <laughs> new patient with ankylosing spondylitis. I called him up, I said, okay, well, how do I measure change? He said, well, these are the protocols. He gave me all the measurement pr uh, processes to measure any change. Well, they have never seen improvement in ankylosing spondylitis, right? They always see a declining uh, pattern of symptoms and loss of mobility and so on. It's a very severe degenerative arthritic condition of the spine, by the way, also called Marie Strumpel's disease, okay? And it's a, it's a, it's a genetically, uh, I would say there's a genetic marker which predisposes the individual, but in cases that I've seen since, for that one and subsequent, the onset of symptoms usually due to in significant injury. That's what seems to precipitate the onset of the symptoms and the uh, restrictions. So what is normal in those people is that they actually have enlarged, you can see the enlargement of the vertebrae and the disc space. And, and I mentioned that to Dr. Masi. I said, it looks like these, these vertebrae are actually lengthening and because they're actually embedded in calcium. They're so obviously visible. He said, you know, you're right. We never considered it. Right? So there's actually that change you can see in graphic form. So areas of bone, uh, areas of our body that are very vulnerable. Humans, uh, because of the kinds of activities we do, we have a high center of gravity as well. We do high speed sports, skiing, skating. Chris is a good example right here. He's <laughs> had to put him back together many times. Um, but essentially, we tend to fall on parts of our body that transfer a lot of energy to our structure. So I've in indicated, this is from my book, uh, indicates many of the sites we see as, as primary impact sites in the skeletal structure. Now, of course, that energy is also transferred internally to the organs, okay? But you can actually visibly see changes in many of these uh, bone structures. So structures most vulnerable, the fluid-filled organs and the bones. The cranium is an interesting one. We've done a few studies looking at the cranium. Clinically, we see p many, many head injuries, of course, and uh, we see evidence that this fluid-filled nature is very important. We see energy being transferred from the skull to the fluid to the opposite side of the skull. We can actually measure those changes. It causes rupturing of blood vessels, changes in uh, skull shape and integrity, and uh, as well as alteration of apparent neurological issues. So we see many uh, we measure routinely neurological things here, like uh, Babinski response, pathological reflex. For those of you not clinicians, these are ways of measuring change in the nervous system, which most people associate with damage to the nervous system, when in fact, changes to the shape of the skull seem to create the same problem, because we can actually correct those by treating the skull. So I know I'm not 
fixing the brain cells. I'm, all I'm treating is the skull. And they seem to, we seem to be getting rid of Babinski responses and getting rid of pathological reflexes and so on. Okay, now this is a concept that uh, for a long time, I, you know, I was, I, I was trained in osteopathy and chiropractic and naturopathy. Um, so we were treating a lot of the fascial issues, muscles, joints, and, and, and et cetera. And I would find that the problems just kept coming back, all right? So this is why, as I evolved my thinking, I thought there had to be a more underlying reason why muscles kept getting tight, why people had to stretch all the time, why it, was, it seemed like it was constantly under strain. And uh, this concept of the fascial envelope is something I think may be useful. If you look at the skeletal framework, which is this dense um, bone structure, which is uh, subject to injury, impact injury, and then you add the fluid-filled organs, which are also subject to injury, the, if you consider the fact that this whole structure can alter its shape because of injury, it can actually expand, essentially expands, then you realize that the fascial envelope, which is represented by this big oval, all of these muscles, joints, and fascia are going to be, the, tr the energy is going to be transferred to them. So when you see tension in the fascia or the, mu or the joints or the muscles, in fact, in many cases where it's due to these deeper injuries. And that's what I find with many uh, practitioners who come to visit me who are fascial experts. They say, okay, test the fascia in this area, all right? And um, I'll use this model if I can, Stephen. Is that all right? So if you look at the fascia around this structure, let's say the muscles or the periosteum or other the deeper superficial fascia, let's say this represents a piece of bone, that fascia will have a certain um, uh, degree of tone around it, which may be supple. But if you change the shape of the structure, basically my contention is that the whole thing expands. Now you're trying to, you're, you're actually altering the amount of stretch on the tissues around it and in fact, a lot of what we see is this ropiness uh, of the, the muscles and fascia. When we correct the deeper structure, instantly resolves. So I, I have one of our therapists, uh, Liz, I don't know if she's here today. No, she's not here today. She's a, she does myofascial therapy. When we started showing her these things, the things that she would test and look for, these ropey areas that she would normally treat, we treat the, the heart or the, the femur or whatever. She goes back, she goes, oh my god, it's gone. Like, she had, to, and that's of course why she decided to do matrix repatterning is why she realized that this is an important intervention. Not to say that other therapies are not useful. I'm just saying if you don't correct the deeper structures, they will tend to come back. All right? Strain patterns. Uh, this is uh, the idea of one part of the body affecting the other. is very important because if you take a structure that's restricted, they're represented by this pull on the fascia. This, this pajama lady here represents that. This represents a primary restriction. As this person, you can't see the lines very easily here, but there's lines of force going up into the shoulder, across to the knees. You're altering the mechanics of the entire body. And as a result, you get alteration in joint mechanics, you get irritation, uh, you get strain and pain often not in the site of the primary problem, which in fact was sore probably when you first injured it, but now it is constant information. Now the brain adapts to constant, all right? You put on your clothes in the morning, within 30 seconds you don't even notice you have them on, you don't, you're not really aware of it. Your brain is adapted to a fairly constant base of information because it no longer considers it threatening. A change is considered more threatening so if I had a restriction here, and then I go to move my shoulder here, that's an intermittent stimulation which my brain goes, ah, oh, there's something changing here, it's irritating, I'm gonna alert you to that piece of information because that is potentially threatening and you need to know that, all right? Whereas if it's constant, it's not really gonna be there, it's not gonna be as obvious to your conscious awareness, all right? That's important because many of us when we look at someone who's in pain, whether it's back pain or shoulder pain or neck pain, are often focused on the area of pain. And, uh, and with matrix repatterning, we're really looking at finding the primary restrictions which affect those intermittent changes. And sometimes there is pain in the area of primary, but often there isn't, and you can't rely on that. So you can use something fairly objective to determine these primary restrictions 
that will allow you to find how to, how to correct those, plus release and normalize the entire fascial system, which removes the other painful sources of irritation. And you can actually demonstrate this to a patient. For example, you might notice, for example, Chris, that you've occasionally had discomfort in certain ranges of motion with your shoulder. And you thought your problem might have been in your shoulder. When in fact, you can easily demonstrate to, this to a patient by having an area that's primary temporarily corrected, have them move their shoulder, oh, it feels much better. And then you correct, correct it permanently and they notice that that symptom is improved. So you don't rely on symptoms, in other words. I mean, that is endless. I mean, chasing symptoms has been something that has always been onerous to me, and I hopefully that's why most of the practitioners are here, because they're, they're not interested in that. And, and certainly, you're, most of you are doing things that are even beyond the pain threat idea, but you're recognizing that there may be more to the story. So hopefully, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be adding to more to the story today and in the next couple of days. Finding out where the primary is is a bit of detective work. You know, when you analyze someone and you, you say, well, I think this, this and this happens, well, sort of, you know, people call it the funny bone, and it is the humorous, which is kind of funny. But you know who it's funny for? It's the person watching you get injured. There's really, I don't know why they call it the funny bone, but anyways. There are many factors affecting health, all right? There is, we talked about stress, genetic influences, nutritional factors, toxicity, pollutants, allergens, and injury. All of these affect our ability to adapt. The body is amazingly resourceful at being able to adapt to many factors, okay? We're dealing with one aspect of that in terms of mechanical injury, okay? But what seems to be important here, if you extrapolate back, is if this injury is present, okay, what other effects does it have? Everything affects everything. So your ability to process through organs that may now be impaired. Liver function is what we think. I've, for example, we've seen several cases now where people on cholesterol-lowering medication, when their liver is treated, their, liver, their cholesterol plummets. I'm talking about significant reduction. So now to the point where I warn people and I suggest they get back to their physician to have their cholesterol monitored, because in my opinion, low cholesterol is a significant health risk as well. All right? As a matter of fact, my opinion is it's more of a health risk than high cholesterol, but we'll talk. All right. Um, but also your ability to digest and assimilate organs like the pancreas, which are not only exocrine, they're endocrine, right? Endo exocrine producing digestive enzymes, the stomach being a primary, all of these things affect your ability to digest food. It's important. Potentiating genetic uh, issues like the, the people with ankylosing spondylitis were born with the gene, but many go through life. I'm treating, all, I, I treated someone his whole family of ankylosing spondylitis, but he hadn't developed much of the symptoms until recently, until he had an injury, right? And he's, he's in his 60s, right? So he didn't have the expression of that gene until something else happened, right? Which was this, all right? And plus, it, it is a source of pain. So pain, physiologic imbalance, biochemical imbalance, all can add to stress which can create a vicious cycle as well. So we're, we're affecting things, even though we're intervening in one area, we may be affecting many other factors. When things are working beautifully, it's, it's the, the body is incredibly, just a work of art, as you see. This is the, the from the Body World's exhibit, I uh, forget the fellow's name from, uh, where is he from, Russia or in Germany? Germany, yes. And uh, it was interesting when I looked through the exhibit, uh, Kim and I were there, and we were noting all of the asymmetries in the bone, which we'll actually be observing, and it's incredible. So I would, you know, I point out to people as they walk by, I know why this person dies, right? <laughs> yeah. they could, I could have fixed them. As a matter of fact, I mean, no, I, there's a certain point you have to sort of say, okay, I can't do much more for that individual. The body is a beautiful thing when everything is working in harmony, and the ability to do things in incredible fashion. Uh, is just beyond belief, you know, this organism and, and a life itself is an expression of, of beauty and balance, all right, when it's working well. Okay, so pain can be a bit of a confounding factor that we, we're looking at and we're saying, well, here's the problem, the pain is the problem. Well, it's not the problem, all right? Pain is often a reaction to something else. So the correction of the cause is our goal. Now, it's often in these deep core issues. We talked about the bones and the organs, all right? 
So these are areas that many clinicians have not been looking at, or how do we look at them in the first place, right? This is really addressing it at the cellular molecular level, which in a sense, in my opinion, is every therapy that we're using is affecting the system. This is the way the body looks. This is it, all right? We know this is what we're dealing with, so how can we best address that, okay? That's been my challenge in looking at this concept called matrix repatterning. So we're looking at well-being, not disease. We're looking at supporting normal function, optimal function. It's inherent in the body. That, that normal state is there. So we're focusing on solutions, not treatments. We don't want to be treating people. We want to help them get on with their lives, okay? And that's the goal of this therapy. That's been my ultimate goal. And it's a constant learning process, you know? When I teach practitioners or people come to our seminars, to me, it's a great opportunity for me to learn because everyone has new insights. You know, when I talk to even people who haven't been exposed to a lot of it, questions, I'm, I th hopefully I th I'm still very open to questions and listening to the practitioners that are out there because we all have something to add. There's this medicine and that medicine. There's lots of different ways we can do things, this method and that method. And then there's the way the body really is. Well, if we're dealing with something that's as close to the model as we can get, I agree with you, the models are never perfect. This model seems to be fairly congruent with much of the observed evidence, as close as I've ever seen. So I'm open to other suggestions because I know there are many influences that affect us. Mm -hmm.